اصحاب السعاده الحضور الكريم اشكركم طبعا على الحضور في هذا الصرح الجامعي الكبير اشكر جامعه محمد السادس متعدده التخصصات التقنيه على هذا الترحاب منذ يوم الامس ونحن نزور هذه الجامعه لا اخفيكم باننا انبهرنا ونحن ندخل الى هذه الجامعه سمعت عنها الكثير من الكثير لكن اتصور انها بهذه الطريقه انا قد سمعت عن هذا الكثير من 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 for this event for months and um, it has taken us a lot of planning organizing and also collaboration between all the teams in order to have a perfect event for you Ted in collaboration with the Qatar Foundation for Education and Development both have thought about a very fruitful project which is TED in Arabic. TED that is dedicated to our stories, to our population stories as well in Arabic measures our success and uh, our beautiful thoughts. We have picked Bengarir, which is a beautiful coincidence and it has a beautiful meaning also, very symbolically, uh, very symbolic as well. Uh, I love this beautiful area of Atlas, not far away from uh, the Sahara. So. إذا <تصفيق> أمامكم في هذا اليوم قبل أن أعرفكم على أبطال اليوم لأنهم في الحقيقة هم أبطال دعوني في البداية أقدم لكم شابة قطرية اكتشفت للتو أن عمرها 18 سنة فقط لكنها أتتنا من جامعة جورج تاون وقيل لي عنها أنها متحدثة قوية لدرجة أنني خفت شخصيا أن تأخذ مكاني في النودة ربما المقبلة لكن علي اتحاد سأترك لها الخشبة اسمها موزة الهاجري وهي معنا الآن تفضلي موزة In Qatari, we say welcome, and uh, the Lebanese poet says that a language, if it was heard, it's actually one of the most beautiful ways to create relief for my beloved ones, for my population, and uh, welcome everybody. My name is Moza Khalid El Hajri from the University of Georgetown, and uh, I am from the Qatar Foundation also, and I wish you a great experience in TED Arabic. In Spanish, uh, the constructor is asked to uh, to build, and this building. This, this building term is derived from the Arabic language. We don't know exactly how the Arabic influence is, uh, is, is how, the, how the Arabic language is influencing the European culture. And that, this uh, rem reminds us of the Andalusian culture going from uh, Morocco, leaving behind over 4,000 words in the Spanish language. And there are many examples on the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Western cultures borrowing terms from the Arabic uh, languages. And that th this uh, goes in many um, sectors. However, just to, uh, ha just to remind you, I would like to tell you that everyone in this room knows of the entire beautiful and prestigious history of the Arabic language, and I share the, these informations with you. However, um, they are overlooked in reality because today's generations 
in storytelling and historical influence of the Arabic language is not uh, influential enough uh, thanks to today's uh, evolution. And so we are just memorizing what the history books are telling us and we are not uh, taking part in building a future for the Arabic language. And in order for us to do so, we need to go back to our Arabic roots when it comes to the verb to build. Building does not start from highways or skyscrapers, but building the mind. The mind is built based on arguments, and the arguments and hypotheses are built on the, strength, the linguistic strengths. And that's not just in grammar. It's also in terminology and culture, as well as the ideology of the speaker. And by that, I mean that Arabic shapes the way we perceive the world, which is why the Arabic language, thanks to all of its capacities, we may use these tools in, for example, uh, the wide array of vocabulary and eloquence, as well as uh, literary heritage. And based on these uh, tools, we are able to shape our ideas and write them in order to have a good Arabic uh, consciousness. And in this context, we have been tirelessly working in the Qatar Foundation to, uh, uh, to pay closer attention to the Arabic language and uh, nurture it thanks to the many sectors we are studying. And that, that's uh, the result of our partnership with TED. Uh, that is to build more bridges from the Arabic language to more cultures around the world in order to deliver our ideas and share them with the world. And from Morocco, which has always been a breeding ground for a breeding ground for all cultures around the world to contribute to building uh, ideas and cultures. And this is going to allow us to have a very uh, influential Arabic language all around the world, thanks to this partnership with TED. And speaking of uh, international influence, we are one and a half months away from the launch of the World Cup, in, uh, which is the first time a, an Arab country is going to host the World Cup ever in history. And that is uh, an exceptional opportunity for us to introduce our very unique uh, Arab culture. And so this reminds us of the international resolution of the FIFA to have the Arabic language as an official language for the uh, union, which reflects the influence of the Arabic language on the, one of the biggest uh, sports events in the world. The Qatar Foundation has also uh, made sure uh, to uh, to host uh, as the uh, as one of the hosts for World Cup to uh, welcome all of supporters of soccer and football around the world and uh, have it, have them join us in Qatar and I would like to end my speech with a video that uh, shows us the uh, celebrations and ceremonies uh, relating to this event. <laughs> This test, Rashid. Rashid. Well, Safwan. Sir, Ad Rashid, tell me what you hear me. يلا بالزربة 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 جدري قبل ما يدي يحبس الفيديو يلا مختار يلا عاد راشيد قول لي أنا بتست راشيد راشيد الحين ذي مارين واحد فيديو بغينا نصار يلا سير and the test 
عنده تيست رشيد عنده تيست عنده عنده تيست رشيد عنده تيست رشيد عنده تيست رشيد عنده تيست رشيد Indeed, we have forgotten about the World Cup, and Morocco is highly omnipresent in this um, World Cup. And uh, Morocco will have tickets. Who, who's coming to the World Cup? Who's coming? Raise your hand. So, actually, I am uh, voted for Morocco, and I think. Morocco will win over Canada, and I'm going to attend this game because I'm encouraging and supporting Morocco. Uh, even though I have, uh, I don't have much experience and knowledge about football, but still. Uh, actually, TED Arabic will be broadcasted in YouTube, so you don't need to take pictures or um, make any videos. Don't worry about it. So please put your phones in silent mode. No pictures, no photos are allowed, no videos, please. In addition to that, I would like to welcome 50 new students who are our guests from Tunisia. Yeah, Tunisians, where are you? Okay, from Qatar as well. Kuwait. Kuwait. Yes, Jordan. Beautiful. God bless you all. Beautiful. They came to visit this university, and uh, I shall ask the Moroccan students to take them on a tour. We shall now start our event. The first speaker that I would introduce, and because the speakers will have very rich content we will broadcast for you from time to time as a break some videos that would entertain you as a little uh, break for you the first speaker i shall give the floor to uh, one of the speakers who i have been introduced to the last couple of days uh, a person who you can count on whether it may sound weird to you, but it's a true story. This man has studied and received his PhD in Lyon, in France, and then he went to Cambridge and spent his time as a researcher in the same field, and uh, then, as you all know, uh, he's living the life. He has been spending his time in the uh, university as a researcher, and then he stopped to, sta to start looking into a different field, which is finance, and he became a strategic expert in this research, who is uh, very, uh, who has a strong command of this uh, field. And so he also went to uh, another institute in Germany uh, called Gutliebe. And he was chosen uh, to be uh, among the most inf uh, 50 most influential Arab, uh, uh, Arab uh, influencers in the world. And now we pass the floor on to him, Dr. Charles Mohanad Malik. Hello. I grew up and was brought up in a very neutral environment somehow. I belong to the middle class and I lived in a gated, uh, uh, gated country somehow, socio-politically, and I believed everything I heard. So if the anchor man on TV showed up, from the two government-owned TV stations and the, the anchorman showed up and told us anything ever, I would take it uh, as a given. And if the imam from the mosque told us something, I would believe that it's something straight from the word of God. I never criticized the elderly. And I was told that criticism could lead me to either to jail or to, um, to the grave. And so as a child, I only wanted to eat and live good and play with my friends. After I grew up and went to school, I was told that science is light. 
and I memorized most of the sciences I was uh, taught. Afterwards, I became a preteen, and my, child, my, my parents sent me to France to, uh, to study in the university as, an, as a, uh, a young adult, and that's where everything changed. I wanted to memorize my lessons and couldn't find any lessons to, to study. And I remember the professor that started one of the times uh, to criticize me and told me that he wanted me to deliver a scientific presentation to my colleagues. I became so happy and I felt great and I thought finally I'm going to memorize the entire research and uh, recite it to my colleagues but that was a failure. I knew I failed when the professor came up to me and told me that he, didn't, he did not ask me to just throw up all of the information in front of my colleagues. He did, I did not ask you to memorize the entire research paper. We, we know how to read. We don't need you to tell us what's on the paper. I wanted you to discuss and criticize and review the entire research and tell us how it is from your own point of view. And I, asked, I told him, hold on, what are you talking about? For me as a second, uh, second year student to criticize an entire uh, research paper that was conducted by one of the most important researchers who spent more than 10 years on this research paper, he said yes. And I told him I don't know where to start. I told him I memorized all of the sciences I, I received as a, student, as a younger student. And he told me all you have to do is to learn how to question things, how to doubt, how to incite doubt and uncertainty. But the most important thing is to find answers to your doubts. So if you keep doubting everything, you will think that you all uh, think you are living in conspiracy theories if you don't find the answers to your questions. However, once you learn how to doubt everything and find the answers to your doubts, you will move a little closer to the truth. And that was the first time in my life where I study sciences instead of memorizing it and reciting it. And I started perceiving life completely differently. All of the given information that I received became doubts as if I pressed the reset button in my mind. So for example, I started reading on the, the uh, evolution theory, the theory of evolution, and I saw it uh, completely differently than how I read it when I was a kid. And I read more on the Big Bang theory and how our grandparents uh, unfortunately uh, unfortunately and pessimistically dealt with the sci uh, scientific researchers before, like Averroes. Science has evolved to become a lifestyle. It's not just a study. It's not just a discipline or a, uh, or a living. It's a, it's a tool that you arm yourself with outside of the university. It's not just something that you receive at school and you study and you take tests for and exams. Sciences are the tools that are going to bring us closer to the truth outside of the walls of this university itself. And that's where I'm, I asked myself, why is that? Why the bad relationship between me and sciences? I am not a science a researcher. I was a consumer of all the sciences I received. I studied sciences to consume them instead of partaking in the production of sciences and contributing to the academia. And this is a problem that most Arab countries suffer from. However, there is a solution. There is a solution that would help us improve our relationship with sciences. So we would move from consumption to production as Arab speakers and research, uh, Arab researchers. For example, if you take a look at the medications that we take every day, if you'd like to find the research that were conducted from, uh, for these meds, you will find five countries, the US, Japan, UK, Germany, and France. 
if you haven't, uh, if you overlook these countries, you will find that these countries are spending almost 3% of its GDP on research and sciences and the production of sciences. There are countries that uh, spend more than that. For example, South Korea. South Korea spends over 4% of its GDP on research. That way, we can say that spending on sciences is an importance, it's a need, it's a, it's a reality. And by financing research, we may be able to preserve our culture. If we compare that to, what, to the reality of the Arab world, so unfortunately, we spend less than 1% of our GDPs as Arab countries on research. However, there is another problem. The problem is that some think that uh, financing sciences is, uh, it consists of, uh, of building auditoriums and amazing looking theaters and amphitheaters for students, and we leave them behind. And once we look back at these students, we find out that they are not ambitious to become uh, scientific researchers who contribute to academia. Their dreams are to just become professors or just students, uh, or, or teachers, or teachers' assistants. So we need to move, and in order for us to move, there is just some one simple thing we can do. We have to change the way we think as Arabs. We have to think how can we produce sciences. And in order to do that, we have to streamline our, uh, our uh, scientific thinking in our uh, teaching methodologies. And that could go in five aspects. Firstly, we have to uh, understand and learn uh, scientific research and how to teach it to younger generations based on how we analyze and how we hypothesize and how to doubt correctly all of the information and data we have at hand. And that way, we may prosper and the country, an Arab country, may prosper. Some of you, I can see you are saying, wait a minute, um, we know that sciences have a positive influence on individuals. However, are sciences a good influence for a community or society? This influence may go through an individual, but I don't think that it's going to influence our entire country in a direct manner. I'll give you an example and tell you that sciences are just like a football. I remember in 2003 when, uh, uh, when the, dicta the dictatorship system fell apart in Iraq, we were, uh, we were, uh, we were all exposed, and so uh, all of the uh, Isla uh, Islamo-political wars and ideologies were all expo exposed, and in 2007. Four years later, the Iraqi football uh, team has qualified to the finals in uh, Asia, and they have indeed won. And I remember the uh, the French press um, reporting the news and uh, showing us the ceremonies and celebrations uh, on the streets, and we saw how Sunnis are hugging Shi'is. The Kurds are hugging the Arabs, the Southerners with the, uh, with the Northerners, and they were all united thanks to football. This small football has been able to unite all of Iraq. They were all chanting the same chants, and they were all celebrating Iraq as a whole. Science is exactly like football. It is a tool to unite populations. If you take a look at any scientific event, you will find uh, in these laboratories the Algerian next to the Moroccan, the Syrian researcher next to the Lebanese researcher, the Japanese with the Chinese with the Russian, and they are all working all together on working on the same question, finding answers to the same questions. 
and they are working towards the same goal. They forget about all of their differences and join heads together. And the beautiful thing is we see the same thing in football. However, football is influential more and more, and it is ever-evolving throughout history thanks to its stronger uh, uh, influence. However, for sciences, uh, people forget about their differences and they uh, they leave everything behind and once they are back into society outside of the laboratory they become more human because sciences contribute to strengthening humanity and this is all on paper however in reality you might say that I'm not sure that we can apply this this does indeed apply to uh, the world Let's take a look at the Jordanian Kingdom. There, they have a research center, a center uh, called the Caesar Center, where researchers are working on physics, and that is financed by the U.S. In this center, researchers are working from all over the country to work together. And you may imagine all of the nationalities coming together to work in that center. There are people coming from countries at war with one another, and they forget about that war, and they work together on the same front lines to find answers to all scientific questions. So science is able to unite uh, separated po uh, peoples. And so you might, uh, this is for populations, uh, let alone a, a country that is divided. So sciences with all of its results and benefits can, uh, can improve the lives of everyone. So that's why we need to reach out to decision makers in the Arab uh, countries in order to accelerate five steps. First, we have to encourage the link uh, the, uh, the, the inc to encourage the link between sciences and uh, the economy. We would like to uh, accelerate the uh, investments that support young researchers, researchers that just need finance. They have the ideas, but they, uh, they lack funding. They are producing sciences, but they cannot move forward without funds. And so these funds, if are, are not uh, accessible to the youth, we will, they will not be able to produce science. We have to, secondly, improve the logistical and legal framework uh, to, uh, to, supervise, uh, uh, to supervise these uh, young researchers. So we have to boost their confidence and, uh, their, and improve their trust in us. Singapore, for example, is a small country, and uh, it, however, it does invest in its uh, frameworks to um, to incubate its researchers, because they do not only import uh, researchers instead of exporting them, because they are in need of brain drain. We have to also work on uh, with international research companies. There is a shy attempt, but it's a good one between the UAE and the and KSA that buy uh, uh, research companies in the West, and this is very important because it will uh, it will diversify the economy incomes. And it will also improve the friction between technologies, the Western technologies, with uh, the present communities and societies. And it is the fastest way to import new technologies. I remember when, what I mentioned one time that Charles de Gaulle, one of the founders of France, when speaking about how he was one of the founding fathers of France, he said that we don't have oil in France, but we have ideas. And thanks to ideas, we can build an entire nation. We Arabs have both oil and ideas. So imagine what we are capable of. Fourth, we have to encourage uh, brain, uh, we have to discourage brain drain. However, we should not leave them halfway either. 
we have to secure enough funding for them to be able to come back to their countries and practice their research. I have talked, I have spoken with many colleagues from all over the Arab uh, world and asked them, why don't you go back home and contribute to the advancement of your country? And they unfortunately say that I'm afraid that once I go back, there will be no supervisors and no funding that would allow me to work in peace. I want to go back, but I'm afraid. Some of them who go back, you ask them, how are you doing? And they say, uh, unfortunately, I am working somewhere that's, that has nothing to do with my uh, research field. I want to go back where I studied and uh, work, do what I love. And the fifth step and last one, we have to boost support for all in initiatives that share uh, sciences with the populace. Because if we make science available to all the masses, it will become a habit. And once a uh, people is uh, be becomes interested in all things scientific, this means that everyone is going to be united and that we will have a scientific elite that is int interested to lead the masses towards development. I have a specialized experience in this domain and I had the honor to work with the, uh, uh, the organization of Syrian researchers that I do not represent and I don't work with them anymore. However, it's one of the best experiences I have ever gone through in my life. Because I remember, I remember it as if it was yesterday when we were in Japan translating uh, Japanese research into Arabic, where we we had we made some uh, some inside jokes out of it, and we had a lot of fun doing so. And that's why we need to support these initiatives that uh, that seek to share all sciences with Arabic countries. So, uh, if we have the um, if uh, sciences are a compass for the for uh, the Arab world, it will be an ever developing uh, world. So we have two solutions: we either choose science or choose science. Thank you for your indulgence. شاغل مهند ملك لا ادري اذا لاحظتم الامر بعيدا عن الخبره العلميه هو عالم في قلت في الخليه السرطانيه مستشار اقتصادي لكن الم تلاحظوا هذه البلاغه باللغه العربيه Thank you very much for your speech and your impressive eloquence This is just impressive He went to France in 2000 and spent over 20 years over there and studied in foreign languages and worked with foreign com companies however his eloquence is on par. Everything is on point and this is a lesson for us because language is an identity and sciences and studying them in foreign languages is not an excuse to have bad Arabic. So, keeping up with the scientists, this time with a woman who is here to tell us about all the entire uh, Moroccan uh, the nature. Joining us from Fez. It's supposed, uh, it supposedly Fez is not very uh, popular in Morocco, however she joined us and so we have uh, a saying says that all roads lead to Fez here in Morocco and it reflects the, the Roman uh, saying which says all roads lead to Rome. And so that's exactly what her daughter did, Shawni Abdullah, bin Abdullah, who is a child who lived in Fez and, were, uh, and studied engineering and architecture and went to Toronto and, and uh, taught there, uh, taught architecture there and went back to Morocco and she is now going to be speaking up next. She is Aziza Shawni bin Abdullah. Please join us. The floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. 
My name is Aziza Shawni and I am an architect who is also a university uh, professor. My, uh, my specialty is environmental architecture and I was born and raised in Fez. However, uh, even though I spent all of my youth in Morocco, I did not, I could not discover I haven't had the chance to discover the Sahara until I went to Harvard. And as a student there, I loved the geography in my country. Its, ma uh, its magic and mystery has led to some people like Indiana Jones spending their time and adventures there. And so I had a scholarship from Harvard to uh, uh, to to answer the call of the Sahara that was on my mind, and this led me to study touristic architecture for an entire year, where I went through the uh, Sahara Desert from east to west, and my first stop was in the Dara Valley in South Morocco, which was a huge turning point for me, uh, professionally and personally as well. And so I was surprised with the beauty of the Dara River when I w first saw it. It's an oasis all over, an entire oasis where many, uh, many villages and many tribes came up, uh, was, were brought upon. And so their walls were, uh, their walls were built uh, thanks to soil and dirt. And that's how uh, the Kasbah was, uh, was made. Afterwards, there were questions about the criticism uh, between the oasis and its, de its surrounding desert. This huge difference could be uh, a cause for uh, an oasis to be a, almost a miracle because it's out of the blue in the desert as soon as there is a water source and it becomes a fertile ground. And this is a misconception, of course. The oasis is not a miracle. It's an agricultural land that, has, uh, that, 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 that was thanks to a collaborated effort from a community to, uh, to benefit from water resources. And today, this prestigious oasis is in danger because uh, because the um, inhabitants of these oases, oases are moving towards urban areas and leaving the, their oases behind. And so uh, this is because a huge uh, valley was uh, uh, was keeping the waters from reaching to the oases and uh, because of uh, deforestation some oases have died almost completely and all the walls of the Kasbah fell down and all of the castles were abandoned making them shadows in the desert. The inhabitants of these oases have depended, uh, depended uh, on cement Cement, which does ju just does not go with the desert weather. And so there is also very bad tourism within these oases based on luxurious uh, cement hotels that uh, consume uh, subground or subterranean waters. And so uh, all, there's also uh, quads that are always overstepping the roots of all of the palm trees in the oases, therefore killing them. After my visit to one of the oases, I was furious to see how it's dying because the uh, essence of the Moroccan culture is, to go, is headed towards distinction. Instinction, sorry. And so as I was taught and I was told, Everything is uh, possible, Aziza, through thinking and working, and working from your very heart. I, 
I thought of a small project that answers to all of the problems of the oases, which was kickstarted by the locals. If it, if it is successful, I would like to also apply it to many other desert areas. And uh, thankfully, I, I met this man, Halim Esba'i, uh, who lives in the oasis, and he shares my dream, which is to save the oasis. And so we worked on this project together. Our friendship started uh, exceptionally. Halim was my tour guide uh, during my, uh, my visit. On the night of, our, of one of our travels, we talked until sunrise on everything that plagues the oases. Because he was an environmental activist, and in the early morning, we, went, we headed towards the uh, Sahara Desert. However, we could not find our way because we were so tired with the lack of sleep, Halim forgot about his GPS device and water and food as well. And as we say in Morocco, oh my God, it is a huge disaster. We were surrounded by nothing but sand, and when we ran out of fuel, we had to walk for hours under the scorching sun, and we started seeing the dead. By sunset, we were lucky to meet one, uh, a shepherd who led us to his home, and this adventure made us brothers and sisters, and it led to the seeds of our project. We chose for this project a name of Hamid al-Ghizlan because its inhabitants are suffering from the problems that I have talked about tirelessly because of their location. Mohammed al-Ghizlan is at the end of the valley and so they receive the uh, very little water and so their agricultural areas have shrunk uh, within the last 20 years and half of their population have left towards urban areas, leading to the death of their culture. The decline of this uh, cultural heritage is very alarming because it's the only culture in, in uh, uh, the, it's the only culture in Morocco where most uh, Moroccan cultures meet. Music is considered a pillar for this heritage. As you can see in this picture, each one of these eight villages in Mohammed al is specialized in a different genre of music with its own uh, jewelry, its own outfits, and typical dancing. And so this uh, heritage is very much alive in Mohammed al especially among the youngsters, which led us to uh, guide our project around music and the youth. We have decided to build a conservatory in the desert, and its goal is not just to teach uh, heritage and music, but to also teach deforestation, uh, the fight against deforestation through a touristic uh, sustainable plan that is conserving the culture and, conser and, and uh, protecting the environment. And now I'm going to take you on a tour through this school because it was uh, built on local uh, resources like canes, uh, sugar canes, and wood. This building is not made of any cement whatsoever. The school is located at the meeting point of the, dune, the sand dunes and the oasis. So it was designed in a way that fights against deforestation. It is uh, facing the, uh, uh, the wind direction. And so it has a playground for, for kids, classrooms, an open uh, stadium, uh, an open auditorium, sorry, and, uh, and, a, re and a receiving, um, re receiving lobby. And it is surrounded by experimental gardens. 
and the, the sound of the school on the left of the screen, we have uh, come up with a new plan to fight against deforestation uh, thanks to the uh, thanks to the um, uh, dirt walls and it's special these special walls that uh, pin the uh, the dirt to the to the ground and helps keeping it uh, nurturing for the plants. And as you can see in this pl this picture, the new plan that we are using uh, as a space, as an open space for people to play their music. The architecture of the, uh, of, of the tourist chambers are also contributing to fight against deforestation because it is, uh, it is very ergonomic. And so, we have planted three. Uh, th uh, we have planted three types of uh, trees, palm trees and fruits, as well as uh, seeds for. Um, for wheat, and so we have also a water box that is uh, uh, made of plastic and it is recyclable, where we uh, plant the trees in a way that the roots only consume the water that it needs. And so we are watering these containers once a month. And so that's how the, uh, the trees are growing. And as you can see in this picture, we, this is us experimenting with the water box. Uh, within the school and this is the uh, result after three years this is my son with his uh, friend Umayma playing in this green space this new green space one of the uh, objects that we have invented are water storage containers that can also double as a classroom It is used to recycle water and store water as well. The class could be uh, cooled down uh, by the, um, the evaporation of the water. The water vaporizes and cools down the classes when it's hot outside. So we have started by building the class uh, through, uh, in many months thanks to the funding of a Dutch uh, institution and so recycling water is the essence of the sustainability of this project as you can see in this picture uh, the uh, the way we are recycling wa water and these waters are used for uh, uh, for drinking and watering our plants as well and then we are also um, processing used waters, including urine, uh, to fight against deforestation. And by that, we will have uh, preserved each and every last drop of water. The project also aims to, uh, to, uh, aims to economically sustain the uh, community by managing the school in a way that helps us get funding from the contribu contribution of the Institute of Plain for Change and uh, through music festivals and renting uh, recording studios for musicians. We are working on finalizing the project of our school, which has only one temporary classroom. And we hope that this uh, project is going to be an example for a holistic development of the entire community. How, you may ask. OK, so imagine if all of the huge cement hotels within the oases uh, become a, uh, a sustainable building that applies all of our ideas uh, be, uh, at, the, at the convergence point between sand dunes and uh, oases and so these sustainable hotels will fight against deforestation and help us preserve water resources and will revitalize all agriculture and provide uh, provide organic uh, food for the tourists and higher um, uh, higher local manpower and 
as a closing statement, I will show you um, overwhelming results of our project. So tw since 2017, we have trained many musicians who have taught uh, uh, free classes to the students. And so in one classroom in my friend's cafe, the uh, director and the, uh, the source of inspiration of this school. And last but not least, we have also hosted the Zaman festi Music Festival, and we have recorded and translated prestigious uh, uh, ancient songs, and we have uh, made a, an online platform for all of these cultural songs and folklore. And so now we will uh, we will have one of the students of this uh, school to perform a song for us. ليك والبنتك وليا مي لالا كيفاش عرفتي بلنا الكاس مصنوع في المغرب كتعرفي تقراي عرفتي يا بنتي مي الحاجه الله يرحمها خرجت امي من المدرسه ملي كانت صغيره حيت قالوا ليها الناس عايب البنت تقرا قا فيها الحال كنت كتسنى كل نهار خا ملي يجي من المدرسه باش تشوف كتابو ايوا بشويه بشويه تعلمت تقرا هاجي شحال جبتي في الامتحان الاخراني جيت انا الاولى امي لالا تبارك الله تبارك الله الله يرضي عليك الله يرضي عليك ايوا سولي بعدا غير واش فرحانه الحاجه واش راك سيري انت يا الداغي في القطبان عندك تحرقيهم ما غان مير ا تو دوني ا ما مير كي ما تو دوني ا سون تور لو هيريتاج سي دو لا فورس دو ريغ دو لامور كونتر لا مير تيم دي جو اي لانسي fine, tendue vers le ciel. Le alif est une lettre subtile à l'allure féminine et délicate, et pourtant associée au masculin. Stable, forte et solide, habilement distinguée d'un point, le bas est la lettre représentant la femme. ايوا دوزتيها امي لالا والحمد لله بنيتي كبرت عشرة ديال الدراري بوحدي ملي توفى راجلي الله يرحمه ديك الساعة كانت عندي 40 عام ايوا مكتاب الله عشرة ديال الدراري تبارك الله <تصفيق> حنا حرنا غير مع جوج ايوا فين كان باكم ملي كنت محتاجة قول ليكم كل مرة خصها تضحي على قبل ولادها ايوا مبروك العيد So we have just listened to Aziza, who is actually an environmentalist who 
is supporting the environment, sustainable building, um, who also ensures to give back to the community socially, economically. And now we shall have a musical break. Please enjoy it.
As a matter of fact, I have just understood why Aziza came back from Toronto to Morocco. Yeah, because you are partying, great music. I imagine a beautiful day in such a beautiful environment with such a great music. This is the real atmosphere we're looking for. I have another guest, Miss, which is Khadija Naji. Khadija Naji, they sent me your picture, but I didn't recognize you. Please applaud for Khadija. Hello, Khadija. Khadija, how old are you? 13. Wow, God bless you. Uh, what's this outfit called? Oh, you have a lot of cameras in front of you. So this is called Lizor. It's a... Uh, and this is Tafra, and this is Malhfa. This is uh, our outfit. I've been doing this for two years now. You're, you're very young, and you know that you have specific music for you in your city, and you know that you have a very important role and responsibility in order to um, show us and introduce us to your culture, to your uh, heritage, especially to your musical heritage. Thank you. Just a reminder, a reminder, this is their first time on TV. When I had, when I was 13 years old, I didn't do that, but look at you, you, I don't, I, I'm imagining when you grow up, you're going to be a very inspiring person. Thank you, Khadija. Tell me, when did you start school? When did you go to school? Well, I started in 2019 when they built the, the school and uh, I started in 2020, maybe a year or two. How long are you spending there? I learned a lot of things, music and so many other things, uh, heritage, culture. You sing and you, you do dancing also. Aziz has taken a good care of you? Yes, a lot, actually. Good job, Khadija. Good job. Nice to meet you. It's such an honor. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I really hope that one day I'll see you as a great artist. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you. So we should proceed with our third speaker. I spent days trying to summarize the story of this person. If you ask me to describe her, I would say that this is, she is an adventurous person who has so much knowledge in religion, religion, culture, social sciences, and we have asked her to come here to us with us to talk to us about language, to talk to us about so many things. So actually, she's an author, a poet, and uh, she has a master's degree in physics. Her name is Susan Talhouk. She's here with us. Susan, welcome. Hello, everyone. I was at a workshop after the launch of the initiative of I speak to you from the east and you answer to me for you answer me from the west which was about 10 years ago while I was participating to the uh, innovative initiative uh, thanks to the way we have tried to improve and influence the lives of the youth a voice was raised at the end of the room screaming you are uh, you are just speaking uh, out of the blue for, you are not you are saying nonsense and your Arabic is atrocious I could not believe what I was hearing I am a volunteer uh, out of passion for my language why in the world would anyone attack me I could not understand I had no idea about what I had to do should I yell back in his own words I asked him to stand up and I couldn't because I couldn't see who was attacking me 
when he stood up. He seemed very extremist. I stood in front of him and I said, I love you. And he was shocked. And I told him, my motive is out of love. And so I love my language. And if you or anyone else are fluent in Arabic, you might uh, carry on the expedition of this I initiative. We are all fighting for the same cause, and everyone must support one another. There is no competition in this topic. There is one, uh, one word that uh, flipped everything upside down and made things go from uh, hostile to peaceful. My entire life is revolving around words. Everything I know about myself, my ideas, my feelings, and how to express them were a, an essential element of my uh, development and ev evolution. So the external world and the internal world both revolve around words. I love discussions, I love writing, and I find in my usage of words in a different way, in various ways, a way of uh, innovation. Because it's a way for me to find a new and various, uh, a variously different energy that makes me feel uh, strongly. Because, for example, when I am working uh, on something that requires a lot of speech, I become very serious and realistic, and sometimes I speak in a foreign language because of the nature of the work and based on uh, the control of the foreign language and its command of the uh, technologies and marketing. However, when I am addressing my friends, I speak in words that are charged with love. And this is the bigger challenge, which is to discuss serious topics and uh, with the uh, sense of uh, the winner takes it all, with the passion of love. I believe that success in the, uh, the academia and institutions relies heavily on the use of words in a very clear tone and very smoothly in a way that is also flexible and uh, very objective. And so we have to have words that have these words. And it's not impossible because uh, thanks to the will of, uh, of the people, we can be able to reach to words and languages that have new and better energies. And that is where I believe that this is a, a dangerous thing in my life. Because how can, uh, how can a businesswoman, a successful businesswoman who is, uh, who is very uh, involved in her culture and humanity uh, preserve her language? I started work very early, w back when I was a university student. And I can tell you that preserving the Arabic language is a, a speech that I delivered in TEDx Beirut under the title of uh, who says if we speak Arabic, we stop everything? Afterwards, this speech was downloaded as the first uh, Arab uh, TED speech or TED talk uh, with, with the same title. And this was a kickstart of my career. Simply because one of the businessmen with a project of producing uh, or making Arabic content offered me a job for an, at his international company. And I started working on, uh, on communication strategies uh, in Arabic. And so today, I am addressing my, my daughter with all honesty and pride that um, holding on to my language and culture and my love for my roots is the reason of my success 
and it is a bridge to cross over to uh, more success, which is why I don't understand why people say that the Arab language does not put food on the table. Because despite all of the pressures that we are enduring and the world with, uh, with this cutthroat competition and this uh, consumptive adaption, adaptation that we have started adopting in our lifestyles to keep going, it does not uh, excuse why we are uh, very aware that our cultures are the reason for us being unique and special uh, in our relationships and our work as well. Since I was a kid, I've been talking very calmly and very slowly, waiting for the words to come to mind. And this is something that I keep discovering once uh, every time I think about uh, the way I speak, because it is a because speech allows my ideas to be conveyed over to your hearts and minds, and the the this relationship between myself and speech led me to poetry, and poetry has a way of uh, engraving these words in the mind because it has a, an energy of personifying uh, these feelings. I am still discovering how the world of poetry is leading me to find out more about the relationship between words and music. I am still at the very early beginnings of my research, but I am doing it out of love. And now I would like to, uh, I would like you to imagine a world without hatred, without anger, without any words that are loaded with hatred or madness, a world without screaming. Can we imagine such world? Are wars going to be brought to a halt? Wars feed on anger. Can we, uh, can we uh, declare a war without anger? Are, are our homes and countries become going to become safer for a better world. Imagine a world where we speak without uh, uh, using words that are loaded with anger, superiority, pride, racism even. A word where we speak and address even our family members, loved ones and friends, and other people that we meet at work using words that are less loaded with violence and are more open to accept the other. Words carry ideas, feelings, and emotions, and they influence the way we lead our lives. So please imagine, for example, if we would like to take a look at the way we speak to each other, what are the internal dialogues that we have with ourselves? You would find people saying, I will not be able to land this job. I am too ugly for this. I can't find someone to love. Many people uh, address themselves this way. They talk down on themselves and they are too hard on themselves. However, there are people who say, I will definitely end up being hired and I will find someone to love. I, I, ha I will find someone to give my all to. And that's where everything is going to be a turning point in our personal lives to change, uh, and that's by changing the way we address ourselves. And for me, I'll tell you that I have found out that behind this independent woman and this image that I built, built of myself, I found out that I talk to myself very harshly without any uh, expressions of love. And I keep moving from one achievement to another just to uh, shut down that voice in my head. And once I uh, realized this, uh, I have decided to be more, uh, to, to empathize more with myself and accept whatever God has given me. And I was also aware that there is no reason to just keep running after achievements. 
and accomplishing them because life gives us uh, what we need whenever we need it and this allows us to have inner peace and achieve it. I really hope that you are very passionate and loving of yourselves and I will end with this following idea. If we take a look at the concept of energy in our social lives and uh, realize and uh, take a look at all of the words that we are using, we will be able to harvest positive energy. And our language, our Arabic language, has a lot of words with, uh, with sublime energy. And because the Arabic language is sublime indeed, because it is the language that the Quran was, uh, uh, the, where the, the Quran was used in. It is the language that was uh, used to write the Quran. And so if we uh, frequently use many Arabic words, we will be aware of that. Because for example, Allah as a, as a word, once we keep frequently using it, we will achieve inner peace. And today we hear a lot about the mantras. What is a mantra? It's, it's just a few words. It's uh, taking us uh, to many words and many proverbs and sayings. And in Arabic, there are many words that we use when we are praying and worshiping God. So the Arabic language is not the only language that has these words. However, so why should we leave it behind so harshly? Today there are thousands upon hundreds of thousands of reels, uh, movies and TV shows that are being downloaded by the second. And if we are not aware of the importance of the energy that is conveyed in these words, maybe this would be harm for us, harmful for us without our knowing. And so we have to be responsible to what we receive and what we consume and what we hear. And so I would like to, I would like the entire audience to just close your eyes for a few seconds and tell ourselves in secret that I am cramped. I am cramped. I am very angry. I am angry. I am comfortable. I am relaxed. I feel peaceful. If you would like to have to change your life, use better words that convey uh, uh, energies of uh, appreciation, tolerance, uh, love, and peace. It is the sense of uh, freedom. Some of it is light and some of it is a grave. God has uh, exemplified good word as a sturdy tree that is also sublime and touching the sky. Speech is, is all about uh, good treatment, as the poets say, and they are also used as, uh, they, uh, if one word is pronounced differently, for example, speech, if it is pronounced differently, could be uh, meant as wounds. And so speech could either be a wound or a, uh, or a different speech. The poets say that the wound of a sword heals 
uh, by speech and uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, also says that no one speaks to God ju uh, uh, without after uh, uh, until after getting wounded mostly. فكرة تيد بالعربية صراحة فرصة رائعة جدا حتى نستمع لهذه البلاغة ونستمتع باللغة العربية الضيفة الأخيرة وليست الآخر من uh, so our last speaker makes me wonder who had a dream to become actually an inventor. Have you ever invented something? I had the same dream, actually. I invented words, <laughs> just a joking. Um, our guest had the same dream. When she was a child, she invented and created so many things. But now she has presented nine new things to the world, nine innovations. This little child didn't only create, but became an ambassador in the UN, one of Ban Ki-moon uh, advisors also. This lady is the first woman from the Gulf countries who got a PhD in biotechnology from Harvard University. Um, I, we have Saudis. Well, actually, she's a Saudi. Okay. So she holds nine patents for a machine. And um, Dr. Cindy was voted one of BBC's top 100 women for the year 2018. Dr. Hayat Cindy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Peace be upon you all. When I was a baby, when I was a child, I really loved playing with magnets. And I think that everybody lo enjoyed doing the same. The power of the magnet moving things wirelessly was very impressive for us as kids. And this is uh, done in, uh, in an invis invisible manner. We cannot take a magnet apart to understand how it's happening because there is nothing to take apart in the first place. The only way for us to understand how it happened was thanks to imagination. I was and still am a huge believer of science and I am always a big fan of the scientists' uh, uh, contribution to the scientific world. And to me, these scientists were superheroes. 
I asked my father once, are scientists human just like all of us? He said, yes, why are you asking? And I said, why, are, why do they not look like us? And he said, B through uh, scientist, uh, science and preservation, you can become one of them. And so one time I, uh, I used to sneak to my mom's closet and wear clothes that made me look like a scientist. And I would use a small box on my head uh, thinking that I was an astronaut. And exploration days were one of the happiest days of my life. My parents taught me everything then. During high school, I went to the UK to achieve my dreams of becoming a scientist. And it was not an easy thing to do. I went to, all, to an all new culture and language and new teaching standards. My qualifications were not enough to have me accepted uh, for, uh, in British universities. And so the first year was a shock and shock for, uh, a year that was chock full with uh, tears and sadness. However, in the second year, I have received an, an unconditional acceptance from all of the universities I applied to. I graduated from King's College from London as a valedictorian. And I, I received a, a scholarship from Cambridge to study for my PhD in biotech. In the field of electromagnetic devices and magnetic devices. The magnet is still impressive to me and that is always accompanying me in my journey to find the link between science and society. After my graduation and uh, delivering my thesis, my PhD thesis in the Cambridge University, I tried to look behind the veil of science and find the, its relationship with societies. I went afterwards to the George Weiss site. That is where we were able to uh, find to come to a very important invention that changed the lives of the people, which is a personal diagnosis device which was made from paper and could easily be disposable after use and it diagnoses uh, everything that has to do with the liver and it takes the entire power of a laboratory uh, in, within its uh, tiny uh, size without having to consult doctors or going to hospitals. And this device is going to help the lives of millions of people who, uh, who, are, who have weak immunity in Africa. Bill Gates was impressed with this in invention and uh, contributed to the funding of this company, the company that invented this device. I did not have enough, enough experience to transfer this uh, invention to the consumer's hands. And so one of my supervisors uh, advised me to reach out to Harvard for uh, to study more about business management, to take this idea from a laboratory to a factory. And this was hard for me because business management was new to me as a scientist. And in the first year, I felt like I was the dumbest student in the university. However, after two years through, uh, uh, through seriousness and hard work, I was one of the first uh, people to win uh, an, uh, an award for uh, social innovation and the first award for, uh, from MIT uh, called the MIT 100K. And it was unprecedented for a team to win uh, both awards within the same year. I left Harvard without a complete convention, a conviction that uh, uh, social in inventions uh, are going to reach to the populace. And so uh, I always debated on the need uh, for uh, to, to open to open up to a world that is ever developing, and so I thought of creating a new environment that is complementary for entrepreneurship and scientists, as well as 
tech experts and architects from the Middle East and, uh, and elsewhere and how to support them to transform their innovations to projects that can serve their uh, societies. And so that's how we kick-started this initiative in partnership with the Harvard Innovation Lab and MIT Media Lab and uh, the McKinsey PwC and National Geographic to support social innovation. And that's where we worked on impressive, uh, impressive innovations such as a device that uh, a device that ex estimates the age of a patient in emergencies and uh, getting to know how to overcome uh, problems uh, that plague immunity systems and however it needed some funding for us to reach out to the populace and so the expertise of the MIT Institute helped me to uh, to kickstart the fund uh, uh, that would help us uh, in partnership with the Islamic Bank for Development to uh, to support many innovations and so I supported 95 projects of social innovation uh, among which are Zor Zor has, uh, has worked on uh, fridges that work, uh, that consume solar energy to help uh, farmers preserve their fruits and veggies from, uh, from rotting. This is how they used to uh, save their organic products and this is how it looks like after we introduced these uh, fridges. This man has used these uh, fridges to help farmers uh, preserve about 85% of their crops. And this helped during COVID to preserve, uh, to also preserve the vaccines. And this, this project contributed to uh, job opportunities for the youth. And 50, uh, over 50 fridges were uh, produced. And so the uh, net worth of this project went from 100K uh, dollars to $120 million. Susanna also, I, which I also supported, who has who designed some, ha some housing shelters for the homeless children that, ha that help protect them from uh, natural uh, disasters. And so the houses were designed with uh, using a matter that produces uh, electricity from light and so uh, this helps uh, uh, this this helps provide asylum for shelter uh, uh, provide shelters for homeless children during floods I have also supported a proje uh, Abdullah's project and helping them to kickstart a an online medical platform that has contributed to hiring 60,000 doctors that were jobless in Pakistan. And thanks to this platform, they were able to reach out to uh, 100 million uh, children and women that had no uh, uh, access to medical attention in Pakistan, Iraq, uh, and Yemen. So we have uh, introduced solutions to help farmers to get over uh, everything that plagues their crops. And uh, we, we also activated techniques to save millions of children who die from uh, water pollution. And we have also supported strategies uh, of energy that is less co costing during uh, education teaching, work, and um, uh, providing medical care. So, for the scientists, they are not just white coats isolated in laboratories. They are part of this ever-developing world. We can make science more open to the societies thanks to the openness of scientists to the infinite possibilities by accepting new ideas, even if they are not coming from uh, prestigious uh, universities or famous uh, research centers. Many, everyone uh, can be innovative, and especially within local communities. Uh, 
we are also linking these scientists to decision makers Uh, to also introduce the concept of innovation in uh, politics and poli poli uh, political systems. So when I was an advisor for uh, the UN secretary uh, within the 10 international scientists to help uh, work on uh, achieving SDGs in the horizon of 2030, I was also chosen uh, to be one of the only female advisors in KSA. I was told that this position does not belong to a scientist. I should stay at a laboratory, and indeed, uh, the, the Saudi Congress is not an environment for a scientist, but I was proud of being chosen as an advisor there uh, because it gave me an opportunity to express my voice and voice my opinion. And so being there has taken me away from uh, paying more attention to research, but it's worth it because modern sciences are uh, overlooked by the decision make makers, and this is how we can make uh, we can bridge that gap. My expertise as an advisor and working on the trust funds has pushed me to kickstart a uh, a company called the IQ Institute for Quality, which is a, an advising company that provides uh, advice for Asian. Uh, countries and African countries to support uh, the value of innovation in order to also support infrastructures, uh, agriculture, as well as uh, education and overall quality of life. And it's uh, absolute value. Ideas are all good ideas, and sometimes they are imaginary. However, they could be more powerful if they are applied to a society. Thank you. We have listened to the speakers, and so now the question, after listening to our dearest Suzanne and Dr. Hayat, uh, are very varying speeches. They are normal people, because yesterday I had uh, dinner with them, and uh, people become all normal once they see a Tajin. Everyone is equal in the eyes of a Tajin. So. Uh, what's different about these people? Why did Ted in Arabic choose these speakers in front of this prestigious audience? What makes them exceptional? For me as a Moroccan in this area where we have, uh, because for me being in Ben Gurir, I, find I found nothing uh, uh, remarkable about this, but however, it is widely renowned by, the, uh, uh, by Ben Gurir. And so, these activities and also leisures and people telling stories, sad ones, funny ones. Jamalf now one of the biggest squares, exceptional with its story. And you also have the right to hold stories, to tell stories. Ted in Arabic opens the opportunity and opens the door in front of everybody to participate. You have seen those participants and speakers. You also can have the opportunity to do, to do so. You also have the right to stand up here and will dedicate a platform to share ideas. You'll have all the details about it later on on a video. You can also ask uh, people from Qatar Foundation to help you. And you have a deadline till October 31st in order to present your stories and send your applications. And I really wish Moroccans will have the opportunity also to participate um, in TED in Arabic in Qatar next month. And I would be very happy, why not, to introduce TED in Arabic. 
I shall now leave you with some technicalities in this video. Thank you. هل أنت صانع تغيير مبتكر متحمس ولديك فكرة جريئة قد تغير العالم؟ هل تحلم بالوقوف على منصة تيد وإلقاء محاضرة ممتعة؟ إنها فرصتك. شراكة بين تاد ومؤسسة قطر أثمرت مبادرة تاد بالعربي لفتح الآفاق لأفكار جريئة وجديدة من جميع أنحاء العالم الناطق باللغة العربية ماذا يعني ذلك؟ نبحث عن أصوات جديدة وأفكار فريدة يمكنها أن تغير العالم وتعرض وجهات نظر مختلفة أو طريقة جديدة للتفكير تتوجه لجمهور عالمي باللغة العربية محاضرة تاد عادة تشمل موضوع أو فكرة قد تتساءل ما الاختلاف بينهما؟ الموضوع هو توجه عام تود التطرق إليه في محاضرتك بينما الفكرة هي زاوية محددة تتفرع من الموضوع وبتحمل رسالة فريدة وربما حلاً أو وجهة نظر لم يتم التطرق إليهم من قبل إنها فكرتك وقد تعني عدة أشياء قبل التقدم بطلبك تأكد من أنك تعرف الإجابة عن هذه الأسئلة هل تعرض فكرتك وجهة نظر فريدة للجمهور؟ هل سيتعلم الجمهور شيئاً جديداً شيئاً لم يسمعوا به من قبل؟ هل سيتعرف الجمهور على حل جديد لمشكلة ما سواء كان ذلك محلياً أم عالمياً؟ هل أنت واثق من أن فكرتك ليست مقترحاً لمنتج معين؟ إذا كان جواب نعم فمن الصداد ليست المكان المناسب لذلك هل أنت متأكد من أن فكرتك لم تطرح سابقاً على منصة تد؟ راجع مكتبتنا الثرية إن لم تكن متأكداً والآن هل أنت مستعد لمشاركة فكرتك؟ إليك ما نطلبه منك جهز فيديو مدته دقيقة تاني فقط للحديث عن فكرتك وأرسل رابط الفيديو مع طلبك منصة شارك أفكارك مع تد بالعربي موجودة هنا اللغة العربية ثرية ولها عدة جوانب بين الفصحى واللهجات المحكية نشجعك على استخدام لغة عربية بسيطة وواضحة وقد تكون مزيج بين لهجتك وبين الفصحى كي يستطيع العالم العربي على اختلاف لهجته أنه يفهم فكرتك بدنا نسمع أفكاركم التقديم متاح الآن وحتى 31 أكتوبر 2022 الساعة 12 ظهرا بتوقيت مكة المكرمة وما تنسى أن فكرتك ممكن تساهم بتغيير العالم إذن Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, people who are following us also online. I shall remind you that we have also other wor training workshops this, this afternoon where you can participate and meet the speakers, the activists, the representatives of Qatar Foundation and TED in Arabic. I would like to thank all people participating and present with us here. للحضور معنا أشكر مؤسسة قطر للتربية والعلوم وتنمية المجتمع لأنها تحتضن هذا الحدث. شكرا جزيلا. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have also the word cop for TED in Arabic. I would be very happy and more than glad to be here with you. Thanks to you, thanks to you guys, thanks to the Qatar Foundation. You have no idea ha about how much we worked and how much effort we made in order to be here with you and in order to present to work with the best standards and norms possible. I would like to thank this university that helps us, helped us enormously. This is the first time I present something and host something here in my country. Concerning TED in Arabic, this is the first time it's organized in North Africa, especially in Ben Grier. Thank you.